Gaius Terentius Varro, Consul 216 BCE. Anyone who has read the accounts of Cannae provided to us by Polybius and Livy can be forgiven for coming away with the impression that the loss of 70,000 Roman lives on a single afternoon in August rest squarely and solely on the shoulders of one Gaius Terentius Varro. However, the reality is not so simple. One of my driving motivations for creating this channel is to offer up critical readings of the evidence and to offer up interpretations which place things in the proper context and explain the biases which often drove the editorial decisions of ancient authors. Varro may not have been a military genius, but he was far different than the boorish, angry, and frankly stupid man found in the pages of Polybius and Livy who rushed headlong in the Hannibal's trap against the sage advice of his consular colleague. In this video, I will argue the following six things. One, there was a narrative about Varro and the battle which emerged decades later and for which we see no evidence in Varro's lifetime. Two, Livy's portrayal of Varro's origins and radical politics is comically absurd, if not downright impossible. Three, Varro's advocacy of an aggressive policy put him squarely in the mainstream of elite opinion. Four, Paulus, his consular colleague, probably agreed with Varro much more than the two of them disagreed, and it is even possible that Paulus was in command on the day of the battle. 5. The divergence in the fates of Varro and his surviving soldiers is an excellent illustration of the nature of the Roman Republic and the ideology of the Senate. Finally, 6. While I would like to rehabilitate Varro to some extent given how much he's been denigrated for the last two millennia, I will show that he lacked moral fiber in a way which is far more damning than losing a battle to one of the all-time great generals. To get this started, I'd first like to consider the sources for the Battle of Cannae and the life of Gaius Terentius Varro. Let us consider the primary sources for Varro and the Battle of Cannae. The first man to write about this topic was the first known Roman historian, Fabius Pictor. Unfortunately, his work has been lost to time, and it also appears that it was not influential for very many centuries. That being said, he was the first to pick up the pen, and he was a cousin of Fabius Maximus, so most likely other senators read his work and had it copied for quite some time. I think it's safe to say that as a known political ally of his cousin Fabius Maximus, Fabius Pictor wrote in such a way which really emphasized the importance of the Fabian strategy, and also would have portrayed anyone who failed to follow it in a negative light. Now, the thing about Fabius Pictor's account, which we have to take keep in mind, is that he was writing at a time when many of the major participants were still alive, so there were certain biases he could get away with, but he could not get away with any outright fabrications, and he would have had to be careful with certain details, which may have given away that he was trying to promote a certain narrative. The earliest surviving and most detailed work for the Second Punic War comes to us from the Greek historian Polybius, who writes anywhere between 50 and 80 years after the fact. Polybius was just shy of age 30 when in 168, Macedon was conquered by the Romans. Now, Polybius himself was a citizen of the Achaean League, and he came from a prominent family, so he was looking forward to a long and prosperous career in politics. However, he was taken as a political hostage, and he never actually got to become a politician. That being said, he clearly had a very strong interest in political theory and in politics more generally. And one of the more honorable professions that one could undertake if a person were to be prevented from going into politics would be to write history, and that is exactly what Polybius does. His work is dedicated to explaining the rise of Rome and trying to make Rome look more Roman, more Greek, I mean, 
by showing how Rome succeeded due to its constitution and how its constitution worked along similar principles to what the Greeks called the mixed constitution theory. Most likely they had never really heard of it or weren't super familiar with it until Polybius wrote about it, and afterwards the Romans seemed to have really embraced this vision of themselves. Polybius' work becomes wildly influential and not only survived to this day, but was very much well read throughout antiquity and also, by the way, influenced the founding fathers. Polybius, we have to keep in mind, was not just a Greek political prisoner of the Romans, but more specifically, a political prisoner who first grew up in the household of Paulus's son, Paulus being the colleague of Varro. Uh, Paulus Macedonicus had conquered Macedon and he died not long thereafter, which made Polybius now the political prisoner of Paulus Macedonicus's son who was adopted by the Scipio family, Scipio Emilianus. And it appears that while Polybius was quite a bit older than Scipio Emilianus. They did become very close friends, with Polybius becoming his tutor and mentor. And because of this, when Polybius wrote about the Second Punic War, he displays a very clear bias in favor of certain people. He not only shows favorability toward Fabius Maximus, but also toward Scipio Africanus, one of the grandfathers of his friend and sponsor. And also he portrays Paulus in an extremely heroic light. And one way to do that is to make Paulus a victim of the incompetence of his colleague. Well, guess what? His colleague was Varro. So if Polybius can promote his political theory and also explain the rise of Rome, then just assuming that Varro must have been a moron was a small price to pay especially since Varro's descendants were pretty small-scale players in the Senate by this point. Keep in mind, this is at least 50 years later, perhaps as much as 80. If we get to the time of Augustus, the historian Livy is on the scene, Titus Livius, for those of you who are more familiar with his Roman name. And while Livy is an excellent writer, he is not that great of a historian because he is much more interested in dramatic scenes than trying to capture what we might think of as historical accuracy or for having anything like an explanatory model which makes sense. It appears that he in general was not at all averse to inventing small details to try to emphasize his themes or really bring home what he's trying to say about a person or event. We'll talk about some of Livy's details and I'll talk about why they don't make sense and why they probably came from Livy's imagination and not any kind of source that he might have had access to. This, of course, combines to create the traditional narrative that Varro was the villain at Cannae, while Paulus was brilliant, brave, and died due to the idiocy of Varro. So now you know where the traditional narrative comes from and why we should have some questions about it. So let's get into Varro's life proper. So far as we can tell, Varro was not only the first man in his family to attain the consulship, which by itself is enough to qualify him as a new man, but also the first member of his family to even gain entrance into the Senate. This puts him in the ranks of men such as Marcus Tullius Cicero and Gaius Marius, both of whom were the first in their families to enter the Senate and also attain the consulship. And because of that fact, it's safe to say that while we don't really know Varro's politics or his exact skill set, we can say safely that he must have been a very smooth political operator who had both the ability to endear himself to other members of the elite and to the populace as a whole. Livy invents a detail about Varro's ancestry, saying that Varro's father was a butcher. The idea being that Varro had to work with his hands and then have time to dedicate himself to a proper education, somehow miraculously made it rich and then bought his way into politics without having any skills. But if you know anything about how Roman and ancient society worked, you know that it is impossible to build up the extraordinary degree of wealth one would need in our politics if you grew up poor. 
This means that Varro's family most likely had been wealthy for quite a while and that they most likely were a prosperous equestrian business family. It's possible that they owned a good number of cattle or something of that nature, and that's where the butcher story comes from. But it's also possible that Livy was inspired by the work of Thucydides, who talked about Cleon's somewhat humble-ish origin. Cleon's family was not aristocratic, but rather had made their money by doing tannery, I believe, on a large scale. At any rate, uh, Varro most likely never did a day's hard manual labor unless it was to toughen him up. Certainly it was not because that was what he was going to do for a living. Varro most likely therefore also received an excellent education on par with that of anyone who grew up in a senatorial household. And most likely because of his family's wealth, he did have some political background in his blood but probably at a local level rather than in Rome. So most likely he was from one of the aristocracies of a Roman colony or a city which had already received Roman citizenship. Varro would have almost certainly held all of the lower offices on the Curse Sonorum. Even in this period where this was not set in stone, it was very rare for people to skip over anything. And as a new man, it would have aroused a lot of anxiety and suspicion had Varro done so. So he had proven himself to his colleagues by going through all of the steps. And again, because he's a new man, it's very unlikely that he attained the consulship at the age of 42. So most likely he would have been at least a few years over that age when he was elected in 216. It's even possible that he was significantly older than that, but we don't really have any way to know because, again, our two primary sources for Varro's life are not interested in the details of his career, but rather just interested in painting him in a negative way and also discussing his failure. One of the biases that you see in Livy over and over if you study Roman consuls the way that I have is that all things being equal, he will always portray the patrician as being more responsible and more capable than his plebeian colleague. He has a definite pro-patrician bias on display, which I suppose comes as no surprise since his sponsor was Augustus, someone who claimed patrician heritage. At any rate, though, Livy also, in the context of warfare, liked to look at popular plebeian commanders who failed and label them demagogues, meaning people who riled the people up in order to get elected and then failed to deliver because they cared more about winning elections than they did about the good of the Republic. So this is an accusation that he levels at many figures in Roman history in the absence of other evidence. This is how he portrays Flaminius, for instance, the man who was defeated at Lake Trasimene in 217. Here's the thing we have to keep in mind. By 216, the war had taken a turn and the Roman Senate had more or less cracked down and ended the electoral process for all practical intents and purposes. By this point, the Senate more or less decided who would hold the offices and didn't really refer anything to the people. So the fact that Varro became consul means that he enjoyed the support of a good number of senators. It is possible that he was popular with the people and that the Senate chose him in large part to get public opinion on their side, but it is more likely that they trusted him in a way which goes beyond a casual acceptance of his membership in that body. The only evidence that we have which might suggest that Varro was in some way radical is that when there was a debate in the Senate over whether or not to give Minutius, the master of horse, equal authority to Fabius Maximus after his small victory, Varro was one of the leading advocates of empowering Minutius. That being said, while that is the less conservative of the two positions, it is worth noting that that position did carry, which means a majority of senators actually agreed with Varro. So most likely this was not really a radical position, but rather something that was done for political reasons. 
Varro would have no reason to be an ally of someone as deeply entrenched as Fabius, someone who was a patrician to the bone and seems to have had some contempt for new men. And it also shows that Varro was in favor of an aggressive strategy. He was an advocate of going after Hannibal, seeking a decisive battle, and Minucius's small victory helped to restore the faith of Varro and others in that strategy. We also see from the events of 216 that Varro's opinion on this was probably the majority. So again, while Varro may or may not have been popular with the people, he clearly did have some support and respect in the Senate, and most likely he was on the majority side, both when it came to the Minucius question and also when it came to Rome's strategy going forward. Let's consider the state of the war in 216 when Varro assumed office. By this time, the war had been going on for about two years. Hannibal had successfully crossed the Alps, a truly stunning feat which took the Romans by surprise. The crossing of the Alps was pretty brutal. He lost a good number of men and also the vast majority of his war elephants. Despite having an exhausted army, Hannibal was then able to win two battles over the winter at Tychinus and the Trebia. And while that did occasion some alarm since Hannibal won these victories in a clever fashion, the Romans weren't shaken. They knew in their heart of hearts that they were superior and that in due time they would crush Hannibal's army. At Lake Trasimene in 217, the Romans were pursuing Hannibal and they were confident of cornering and smashing him. However, Flaminius did not scout ahead sufficiently and he was ambushed along the shores of Lake Trasimene. This led to the destruction of his army more or less. And it also created an actual panic where the Romans thought that they might lose the war. This led to the election of Fabius Maximus as dictator. He then developed the Fabian strategy. It's not entirely clear whether he was dedicated to sticking with it or whether he saw it as an emergency measure, but effectively what he did was to shadow Hannibal, refuse direct battle, and rebuild Rome's army. Mark Keeley, who is an ardent defender of Varro, does claim that Fabius perhaps did not intend this to be a permanent strategy, but we have no way to know. And given Fabius's a reputation for being very stubborn, it's possible that this is something that he was adamant about the whole time. However, this strategy was quickly challenged by the master of horse, Minucius Rufus, who managed to win a small battle against Hannibal that led to the political rift between them, and Minucius Rufus's small skirmish victory more or less restored Roman ardor for an open battle. To a large extent, the Romans seemed to have looked at the preceding three battles and thought that the only reason why Hannibal won is because he was allowed to engage in ruses. That if the Romans were to fight Hannibal head-to-head -head in a man-to-man -man struggle, their numbers and superior valor would crush the Carthaginians. By 216, they had regained their confidence and by all appearances, the majority opinion in the Senate is that the Romans should seek out a decisive battle. Part of the Varro myth is that Varro got people riled up for fighting while Fabius was trying to get them to take a cautious and responsible course. In reality, however, it is more than likely that the position of Varro was held by the vast majority of both the people and the Senate, and that Fabius's was a minority opinion, which even his immense personal prestige could not make into public policy. If we look at the normal attitude of the Roman people, usually what happens is that common soldiers considered it to be an insult to their dignity and their valor if their commanders were hesitant to engage. They often remonstrated with their commanders and demanded that um, the commanders engaged the enemy so that they could prove to that commander that they were worthy of the name Roman. We see this as late as the 4th century CE, where Julian, while Caesar, 
was more or less urged to engage by his men who felt slighted that he was being hesitant just because the enemy had a slight numerical advantage. So most likely the public was on board for some open fighting. The Romans, with very few exceptions as a whole, were quite belligerent. And the senators were really no different in that regard. The senators also very much believed that they had the advantage over Hannibal and that previous defeats were due to Hannibal resorting to ruses. In an open fight, the valor of Roman infantry would carry the day, or at least that was the thinking. The Roman senators were also somewhat worried about the disparity in quality between their cavalry and the cavalry on the side of Hannibal, since he had Numidians and Gauls, but they figured that infantry was the queen of the battlefield and that whoever had the best infantry ultimately held the edge. Another thing that senators were considering is that Hannibal's strategy was to detach their allies by winning battles and ravaging the land while showing that the Romans couldn't do anything about it. So they felt like the longer the war went on, the weaker they looked and the more likely it was that some of their major allies might defect. Rome's military relied about 60% on allied troops. So this actually was a major threat. So far, they felt like they had been lucky since even the great victory at Trasimene had not gained Hannibal all that many allies. So the thought is, we're still in serious danger. Hannibal has a pretty solid strategy, which shows that he understands the weakness in our society. The sooner we defeat him, the better. The Romans could also look at their successes in small-scale engagements and see that their faith in the fighting abilities of their men were not misplaced. Typically speaking, when there were skirmishes, the Romans gave as good or better than they got. We also saw that Minutius had won a small battle, which meant that Hannibal was not invincible. So, um, in Roman eyes, the dictatorship of Fabius had restored order, and also the small victory of Minutius had shown that Hannibal was not invincible, and in the course of the ensuing months between Lake Trasimene and the accession of Varro and Paulus, all of the momentum that Hannibal had gained had been lost, and he hadn't really gotten all that much out of his victory. So now was the time to seek a new decisive battle and the two new consuls would go in with a lot more force than what Flaminius had had, and hopefully they would get a different result. If you think about it from their perspective, all of this actually makes a good deal of sense, and this is hardly delusional thinking. A key pillar of the Canai is entirely the fault of Varro narrative is that Paulus, his consular colleague, was a political foe who opposed everything about Varro's plan and thought that it would lead to certain doom. However, as we'll see, there is very little evidence that this was the case, at least outside of Livy. For one, this narrative rests upon the idea that there was a close relationship between Fabius Maximus and Paulus. While they were both patricians, that does not mean that they were best friends. We know, for instance, that the Scipii and Fabii were not on good terms, even before the rise of Scipio Africanus. In fact, one of the reasons why Fabius Maximus is so eager to slow down Scipio Africanus going so far as to hamstring his efforts to raise an army to go to Africa is because their families are traditional rivals. We also know that there were some major differences in outlook between the Scipii and the Fabii. Fabius Maximus was very traditionalist and cautious. Scipio Africanus was very forward-thinking and very much open to new ideas, um, including sometimes rejecting portions of Roman tradition, which made some of his colleagues a bit uncomfortable. We don't really know Paulus's politics or alignments that well, but we do know that when he was consul, he engaged in some rather creative tactics to lure out his enemy. So it's possible that he was a little bit more like the Scipii than the Fabii. We also know that his daughter later married Scipio Africanus, which means that it's possible that the two families were already in a political alliance in 216. 
certainly they were later, and that's why Polybius' account is very favorable to both Paulus and Scipio, who otherwise might not have been allies, and certainly they were of a very different age from one another, so it's possible that, say, Paulus and Scipio's father or uncle were friends, but the difference in age between Paulus and Scipio Africanus would be too great for them to really be good friends. There's also the famous story of Fabius begging Paulus to avoid a field battle. And I think most people read this as evidence that there was a close relationship and rapport between the two men. However, this could also easily be read as a man who holds a sincere belief humbling himself before a political opponent in the name of the public interest. It's also, of course, possible that this is just a story that was invented to show how fervently Fabius believed in his strategy and to make his warning seem prophetic. We don't really know. Livy also has a weird detail, which is definitely not true constitutionally, but is interesting nonetheless. And that detail is that Varro was so popular with the people due to his demagoguery that they decided to vote for just one consul and they wanted Varro to serve by himself. But then Varro presided over a vote which appointed a patrician colleague and he got Paulus. If this is even remotely true or if this does reflect the actual level of popularity Varro had, then it does imply that he may have had some influence over the selection of a colleague. And if so, then clearly he thought that Paulus was a friend. Certainly, as I've shown already, the Romans as a whole were in favor of seeking a decisive battle, and it's unlikely that they would have chosen to elect someone who did not share that view, since otherwise having two consuls sharing command where one wants to engage in a decisive battle and the other one very distinctly does not would be something of a nightmare. If there was any bad blood between Varro and Paulus, it does not seem to have been on display when they were making their preparations for the Summer 216 campaign. Both consuls worked feverishly to raise four new legions in order to supplement the four veteran legions. Polybius in particular notes that Paulus had a great deal of ability and experience and that this helped to inspire confidence in the new recruits. Livy also shows Paulus engaged actively in recruitment. There's also a speech that Paulus delivers talking about how the Romans will meet and defeat Hannibal in battle. This, of course, clearly suggests that Paulus was all in on the strategy of facing Hannibal head to head rather than continuing the Fabian strategy. The two consuls were able to ultimately assemble a combined force of 80,000 infantry and 6,000 cavalry. And although they had the assistance of a huge number of subordinate officers, including the proconsul Geminus, the former master of horse Minutius Rufus, and 48 other tribunes, including a young Scipio Africanus, an army this large was not at all easy to manage or supply, and that's something we should keep in mind. This army was only assembled a week before the Battle of Cannae was fought, and because this was the largest army that the Romans had ever assembled, it is safe to say that no one had any meaningful experience on trying to manage a group of men this large. So despite the number of experienced officers present, this was still a relatively unwieldy force. Cannae, even in its ancient prime, was little more than a small town in Apulia. This was not one of the major cities of Italy. So why was it so important to both Hannibal and the Romans, and why was this decisive battle fought on the fields of Cannae? The simple answer is that Hannibal had spent the previous winter in the neighborhood of Garunium, but he had exhausted his supplies there and was looking for a new area which would have some places that he could plunder. Another thing to keep in mind is that Cannae was a supply depot. Hannibal was aware of its existence, and the Romans, in fact, were using it in order to keep some of their forces in the field. Their goal was to hem Hannibal in and then seek a decisive battle near Garunium, and for whatever reason, they did not realize that Hannibal, one, would run out of supplies, 
and two would respond to that by going somewhere else. So when Hannibal managed to march past the Romans and then appear in their rear at Cannae, they were somewhat alarmed. We have to keep in mind that this Roman army of 80,000 plus men required a lot of supplies and that the Romans had been counting on the supplies at Cannae to keep that army in the field. So this meant that the Romans, if they were to go after Hannibal, would need to find other supply sources. One quick solution would be to recapture Cannae and the stores within, assuming that Hannibal didn't burn them all. Hannibal, for his part, had little incentive to leave the depot since he did not have the kind of wagon train to carry all of the stuff off with him. The uncertainty of the supply situation made a quick resolution more desirable than ever, and also Cannae is a fairly open place, so the Romans felt like this was the place for a fair fight. The downside to a place like Cannae is that due to its openness, this is a place where Hannibal's cavalry can be deployed to the greatest effect. However, it does not appear to be a place where you could mount any kind of a meaningful ambush, and also you're marching toward a source of supply that your massive army will need. So fighting at Cannae made all the sense in the world to the Romans, and it was also a place worth defending for Hannibal. The accounts of Polybius and Livy show that once Varro reached the area of Cannae, he and Paulus began to bicker over what to do. Supposedly, Paulus's objection is that fighting on the open field would favor Hannibal because of his advantage in cavalry. This does not necessarily mean that he was opposed to the idea of seeking a pitched battle. As we've seen, he gave a speech in favor of the battle. Perhaps he wanted to force Hannibal out by cutting off his water supply or doing something of that nature and then face him in a slightly more constricted arena. We don't really know for sure. What we do know is that when Varro arrived, he was in command on the first day. His forces skirmished with Hannibal to some extent. Hannibal's men withdrew some. And on the second day, Paulus was in command. Most likely the reason why he did not engage is not because he was averse to it, but rather because his men needed time to rest before a major battle. Um, any, at any rate, Hannibal sent out more skirmishers and they apparently mocked the Romans trying to go up to their gates, prevent foraging, etc. And supposedly the taunts of Hannibal really inspired the ire of Varro, who could not handle being taunted. And this made him more determined than ever to attack Hannibal headlong in order to avenge his wounded ego. The next day, Varro united the army. Paulus had divided the camps a little bit to provide for more forage. And after marching to get all his men in line, Varro formed into a dense formation with the object of smashing Hannibal's waiting army. Each consul was commanding the cavalry on the wings with Varro holding the citizen cav and Paulus being with the allies. Almost certainly this means that Varro was in command since citizen troops were more prestigious than allies. However, Paulus' command was slightly larger, I believe 3,500 as opposed to 2,500. That being said, um, while Healy does believe that Paulus was actually in command, I think that due to the fact that Varro was leading the citizen cavalry, this means he must have been in command. Also, we see that both of the consuls were clearly deeply concerned with the cavalry situation and they felt like their personal presence on the wings with those units would keep them in the battle longer and they were counting on all of their various legates to lead the troops to victory through the center. The idea being if you can hold out just long enough on the wings then the infantry in the middle can smash their way through, Hannibal's force will be finished, and then the battle will be over. It's safe to say in hindsight that Varro's strategy was far from brilliant and that he really should have thought harder about the potential downsides to advancing with a densely packed formation. That being said, there was a certain logic to the strategy and it was not without at least some merit. Uh, 
In classical Greece, the Thebans had used loaded wings to great effect in order to get quick results. The denser a formation of ancient infantry, the more likely it is to achieve a breakthrough or push back its opponent. And again, the Roman goal is to just hold serve on the flanks with the cavalry while the infantry overruns the center of the enemy. Hannibal, however, anticipated the problem with this, and he accordingly made his center deliberately a bit thin so that way it would bulge out. His wings were packed densely so that they would hold their ground, and his best troops were on those wings. The Roman formation was propelled forward by its very density and filled the bulge perfectly. Meanwhile, Hannibal's cavalry, which was superior, was able to achieve victory more quickly than the Romans had thought, and that enabled Hannibal to complete his encirclement and then spend the rest of the day slaughtering the Romans. Hannibal, in other words, was brilliant, whereas Varro was mediocre. I wouldn't go so far as to say Varro was completely incompetent or delusional in his planning, but again, he did overlook some things, and you cannot pull off a brilliant victory without the unwitting aid of your opponent. The Romans, of course, lost about 70,000 or so men in a single day after this dense formation managed to cave in the center and they were enveloped. The wounded Paulus, after his cavalry was defeated, managed to make his way back to the main body. He tried to keep the troops going, supposedly, but ultimately he too fell with his men. Meanwhile, it appears that Varro was completely swept off the field. He was faced by Maherbal and the Numidians, and most likely that was a short fight, which did not last for long. Varro only escaped to a nearby city, Venusia, with 70 cavalrymen, so this implies that his command was absolutely hammered. Polybius tells us that around 3,000 or so Romans were able to cut their way out of the encirclement and fight their way to safety in the neighborhood of Cannae. In time, they would all regather under the same banner, but in the immediate aftermath of the battle, they were scattered about as each group had just escaped to wherever it could. Another 10,000 or so men were actually taken prisoner at Cannae, having surrendered when they saw that the situation was completely hopeless. At Venusia, Varro began the long, slow process of trying to regroup the survivors, and it was really his tribunes which did most of the work, but Varro did his part as well and rebuilt something resembling an army. When the dictator Pearl was elected by the Senate, he was able to assume command of a small but battered army that Varro had assembled. When Varro returned to Rome, rather than being censured for his incompetence or put to death as some sort of traitor or something of that nature, Varro was instead praised and applauded by his colleagues because he had not despaired of the Republic. There are a number of things that we need to talk about as to why this response happened. So the Romans were not above finding scapegoats for disasters. The Romans would actually bury a Vestal Virgin alive after Cannae because it was supposedly her sexual impropriety which had brought about the wrath of the gods. However, they did not see Varro as significantly responsible for the defeat at Cannae. And that is because in the ideology of the Roman Senate, the soldiers are responsible for military defeats, not their commanders. Cannae, therefore, was not a failure of the commanders to do good generalship, but rather a failure of the soldiers to do their duty properly. So Varro was thanked for keeping his stuff together after this massive defeat and keeping his cool. It also showed that he was a good Roman, he had done his duty, and the Senate still held him in high regard. So not only does this illustrate what we know of Roman ideology in the Republic, i.e. that senators are not responsible for disasters, but it also helps to illustrate the fundamental idea held by senators that any one of their number was sufficiently competent to command an army.
If the Republic entrusted you with the office, you were therefore competent. It was a fairly simple ideology, and it makes sense if you have a group of rich people who share power from year to year. More to the point, it does a good deal of damage to this idea that Varro was seen as the bad guy at Kanai from the get-go. It shows that this narrative about him probably emerged a good deal later. Keep in mind, not only did the Senate not punish him, which would be in line if they thought that he was responsible, but they actually formally praised him for not despairing of the Republic and, as we'll see, continued to employ him frequently. There's no evidence at all that his standing in the Senate was reduced. And in fact, a lot of recent research shows that military defeat rarely adversely affected a Roman's political career. Romans who were good generals only did a little bit better than Romans who were poor generals when it came to their political careers. And in the case of Varro, you might think that they might be willing to make an exception and use him as a scapegoat. But again, the scapegoat that they found, one, you have the Vestal Virgin who was buried alive, and then two, Varro's men. Varro's men were the scapegoats for this defeat. Let's talk about that. To me, the most damning part of Varro's story is not that he was defeated at Kanai and that his generalship led to the deaths of 70,000 men, but rather that he failed to stand up for the men who survived after he failed. He was shielded from responsibility by the social norms of the Republic. That's fine and well, but he could have argued on behalf of his men more vigorously. If he were to try to accept responsibility in some way, most likely he would not be seriously punished since that would be against Roman tradition and the Senate was running low on men, as we'll see. But also, he could have saved valuable manpower for the Republic, men who could be used elsewhere to good effect. Instead, however, Varro chose to allow these men to take the blame for the defeat. Under normal circumstances, that would be one thing, but under this circumstance, the Republic needed all the men it could get, and Varro, in effect, lost a second battle by not fighting for the survivors. Despite the fact that Varro and Scipio and other people fled from the battle, they were not seen as cowardly. However, the common soldiers who cut their way out were impugned for their valor. But they were not so much impugned as the men who surrendered on the field at Cannae. Due to the unbroken string of successes that Rome had had ever since the Caldine Forks, the Senate was extremely intolerant of Romans who surrendered to the enemy. While the Romans did want those 10,000 men back, and quite a few of them had relatives in Rome, even in the Senate, the Senate was leaning toward breaking its old precedent of not ransoming prisoners. However, the arch-conservative Senator Torquatu stood up and demanded that the Romans adhere to their age-old, or at least a couple centuries-old, tradition of not get paying ransom for men who were not brave enough to fight their way out. He said it would be disrespectful to the men who did fight their way out, even though, as we'll see, it appears that the Senate did not have a great deal of respect for that group of men either. So the 10,000 men who had been captured at Cannae were not ransomed, and they ended up dying for it. As for the men who did cut their way out, you might think that because their colleagues who had surrendered were condemned, that this means that the men who'd cut their way out might have a more lenient treatment at the hands of their countrymen. And they kind of did, but not really. The men who had broken out of the encirclement with Varro were considered cowardly. As I mentioned again, for emphasis, Varro and Scipio Africanus also cut their way out of the encirclement, but they were not seen as cowardly for doing so. However, the common soldiers who did the same thing were seen as cowards. The men who cut their way out of Cannae, these 3,000 or so men, were sent to Sicily for garrison duty, the idea being that this was a backwater and that they could hold down the fort so that real men could go fight in Italy or Spain. These guys possibly did partake in the Syracuse campaign, which was a pretty hard fight, but otherwise uh, Sicily as a whole was pretty quiet, and these men were languishing 
in obscurity for 13 years. They were effectively exiles because they had dishonored themselves by daring to cut their way out of a slaughter. They were only redeemed when Scipio Africanus came to them in desperation after Fabius cut him off from fresh manpower, and he recruited them to serve as the nucleus of his army at Zama. It was the survivors of Cannae and not his veterans from Iberia who ultimately defeated Hannibal in Africa and brought the war to an end. These men did redeem themselves, so their story has a happy ending, but it had nothing to do with Varro. So far as we can tell, he had no interest in the fate of the men who had helped him escape from the slaughter. You might have noticed earlier that I mentioned that there were some 48 tribunes or legates at the Battle of Cannae. Most of them died. When combined with the body count from previous battles, quite a number had died at, at Lake Trasimene as well, this meant that the Senate was very short on bodies. It's possible that the Senate only had 100 to 150 members out of the capacity of 300. So this means that even as new senators were put into the body, there was a severe shortage of experienced senior men. This is why you see people like Fabius Maximus, Torquatus, uh, Marcus Claudius Marcellus, and others getting command after command after command until finally some of the junior guys such as Scipio Africanus and Claudius Nero come of age. However, uh, this also means that people who weren't necessarily top tier talents also got command after command after command. And one such person was Varro. He was prorogued to serve as proconsul for at least two or three years following Cannae. So he remained in command of men in the field for most of the rest of the war. There were maybe a few breaks here or there, but there are at least five occasions on which he was brought out either to serve as proconsul or propraetor. However, he was always relegated to tertiary roles and quiet sectors. Most likely he was helping to keep the peace, perhaps uh, keep the allies loyal, maybe to train men in backwater areas, stuff like that. In 208 to 207, we are pretty aware of what he was doing. He was a pro at the time, and he had a small army which he used to reduce Eretium in Etruria. This was a city which had revolted, and Varro was able to bring it back into line. Most likely, this was not much of a campaign, and it was a simple waiting game, but still, he does have a military success under his belt. He also now that he was reinforced with two small legions, may have sent his troops to take part in the Battle of the Metaurus, which would have been fought around this time. So uh, it's possible that Varro played a very small part in that victory, which was one of the most important of the entire war. So yeah, uh, Varro had no other great failures, despite actually having some responsibility. I do have to suspect, however, that if the Senate had been more full, and if some of the surviving senators were not a million years old, that Varro would have had fewer of these commands. Nonetheless, he did just fine with the limited commands that he had after Cannae, and there's every reason to think that while he was far from a military genius, he was serviceable in small roles. Given Voro's reputation in modern times, it may come as a surprise to learn that not only was he still in the Senate after the war ended, but that he was one of the senior members, which means that he would have gotten to speak relatively early in major debates. This means that when the Romans decided to fight the Second Macedonian War, Voro was probably among the men who got to express his opinion on what they should do. Varro was still actually used by the Senate for special tasks, even after the Senate had filled out and there were presumably more capable people in that body. This again implies that the narrative that Varro was the reason why Cannae was lost did not come into place until afterwards. In 200, Varro was part of a three-man delegation which traveled to Carthage to complain about a violation of the peace. 
there was a Carthaginian general active in Gaul, and the Romans were urging the Carthaginian government to recall this general and prevent him from violating the peace. This delegation with Varro also visited Numidia to congratulate King Masinissa on his ascension to the throne. Masinissa, of course, would reign for a very long time, and it was his death which would then occasion the civil war between Jugurtha and Masinissa's grandsons. In 197, Varro was among a group of three officials who were charged with encouraging settlers to relocate to the city of Venusia, the same place where he and 70 cavalrymen had fled after the Battle of Cannae. Here, Varro encouraged people to settle down and try to repopulate the area. In this video, I have demonstrated that Varro was the subject of smears from later sources trying to promote other Roman families. Even when we factor in the source bias of Polybius and Livy, and also understand the general historical context, that is to say that Varro's strategy was widely shared by the Roman public, and also that nearly any other general could have conceivably committed the mistake that Varro made at Cannae. The fact is that Varro's legacy remains an almost entirely negative one. Most obviously, he was the commanding general in what was one of the worst, if not the worst, battlefield defeats in all of human history. That in itself is a damn hard legacy to overlook. As I propose in this video, however, if you want to put Varro down for something, the biggest failure of his life, at least in my opinion, is that after Kanai, he failed to defend the men who had helped him escape the safety. He allowed them to be dishonored and put onto permanent garrison duty. He also did nothing to intervene for the men who had been led to a slaughter due to his being out general by Hannibal. If Varro were truly civic-minded, he would have at least spoken out in their defense, using his position of safety in the Senate as a vehicle to advance the cause of the men who would entrust their lives to his leadership. If he had been a true Roman statesman, he may have even offered up his own life in exchange for the Roman Senate agreeing to ransom the 10,000 prisoners at Cannae. After all, while Varro did do some work after the battle, it is very hard to see how his services as a backwater general were more valuable to Rome than 10,000 Roman soldiers. Later on, other Roman authorities, especially Roman conservatives, would invoke Varro's name as an example of a demagogue and what happens when the popular faction is entrusted with power. Whether that is a fair assessment of Varro or not is hard to say, but certainly Varro was an easy man to smear because his descendants were not able to achieve anything of note in Roman politics. None of his descendants were able to achieve the consulship, although many of them did make it into the Senate in the lower ranks. This meant that when uh, Scipio Emilianus presided over Polybius's histories and allowed Polybius to tar the name of Varro, there was no one in the Senate who could meaningfully clap back against him because the living Varro at the time was someone of no real consequence, at least when compared with Scipio Emilianus. The legacy of Varro, in other words, is a negative one, and while we cannot change the fact that this man was responsible for being the battlefield commander of the greatest defeat in Roman history, we can at least understand that it could have been almost any other Roman senator with any other name. It needn't be a new man known for his charisma. It could have been a patrician, and it's interesting to speculate on how differently accounts this battle would go if the responsible commander were, say, Paulus by himself rather than Varro, someone without a family which lived after him and could really uphold his honor in a meaningful way. I'm Thersites the Historian, and that is all I have for you tonight.